Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Onus, everyone, and welcome to another episode of We Meditate. I am your host, Ahmad Brown, and for today's show, I have a really, really great, awesome guest. One of my main cohorts and homeboys and fellow astral questers, uh, spiritual journeyman, uh, Mr. Kenneth Ja Williams. Mr. Williams, how you doing, man? I'm doing excellent, my brother. Good to see you, Kenneth Ja Williams. Nice to meet you, my brother. Nice to see you again. So, uh, just for we meditate, people, real, real quick, give us a crash course on your journey and what brings you here to this present moment. Okay, let's see. What brings me here? Where am I? <laughs> You're on planet Earth. Planet Earth. Planet Earth. Planet Earth. Planet Earth. Okay. The United Planet States. Of America. United States. Okay. It's 2014 by Gregorian calendar. Okay. Okay. What brings me here? Um, interesting journey. Actually, the more I tell it, the more it feels like I'm making it all up. <laughs> well, the message you walk. Quite literally, what's happening on multiple levels. So I was adopted. Uh, when I was two years old from um, Macon, Georgia. Uh, from Macon, Georgia. Um, and when I was adopted, I was brought out to Potter Springs, Georgia, and Cobb County. And that's where I was raised. Um, and then I uh, went to Georgia State, you know, played soccer growing up, uh, went to Georgia State, did philosophy pre-law and African-American studies. Shout out to Dr. Akineli Umoja. He uh, took me under his wing um, and uh, taught me some courses on African traditional religion. And that was very, very um, important because I grew up in a Baptist church and was always very questioning, but didn't really have um, a uh, foundational understanding of African history, other than Black History Month. Okay, that's when I learned about Black people. Um, Martin Luther King, Black History Month. Martin Luther King, you know, so uh, Martin, Luther, Martin Luther King Month. <laughs> and Malcolm X Month. Not so much Malcolm X, they ain't really. Yeah, they didn't he like makes them guy. nervous. He yeah, makes them nervous. Like that guy, them, them, whoever they are, he makes them nervous. Us. <laughs> <laughs> he makes everybody nervous. Makes everybody nervous. <laughs> so, um, uh, that was very, very powerful. Uh, he taught me some African traditional religion courses um, as directed reading. So everybody wasn't even getting these courses. Like it was very. Um, he knew that I was. I had a thirst for knowledge in that particular uh, area. So he really uh, helped me to point me in that direction. And then after that, ended up coming into college. Actually, as a criminal justice presidential scholar, wanted to go into criminology. Then I found out one out of every three black men is locked up. Coming from white suburbia, uh, Potter Springs, playing soccer, being the only black guy on the soccer team, I really didn't know much about anything. Um, so that was very eye-opening for me in terms of um, learning about black history and African history, and particularly spirituality, because I love the Bible. I love anything I can get my hands on um, that related to spirituality. So um, I left Georgia State Eventually, finally, after switching my major a couple times with a philosophy degree uh, in African American studies, minor in pre law concentration, and went to Emory to study um, theology, um, uh, comparative theology. So I studied, uh, I went into the MTS program in Emory and studied uh, Hinduism, Islam, Buddhism, a mystic Christianity. That's when I met Meister Eckhart. Um, uh, I studied uh, African traditional religion. I studied Egyptian spirituality, and I did that on the side. They didn't know about that. That, that was that was what I was supplementing a lot of my education with. I would gotcha. go home and read more to Ashby and Rhonda for our men. And then at Emory is actually where I met my mentor and a very very powerful teacher and influence in my life, and that's Dr. Will Coleman. Shout out to Dr. Will, um, who took me under his wing and second father to me and really has shown me um, the world behind the world. Mm -hmm. So that has led uh, to me becoming um, very, very focused on the spiritual path. Um, And uh, I guess, let's see, what am I now? I am a yogi. I call it yugi because I learned uh, that yoga comes from huge. Sanskrit word meaning to yoke, to link, to bind, to marriage, to unify, um, to to unite. 
So, um, and I learned Egyptian yoga. So, a lot of people are like, what's that? What's that? Ooh, Egypt the Egyptians was doing yoga? Yeah, they started it. All those positions you see in the caves, everything they're doing, that's yoga. Um, it's about consciousness. It's, only, it's, always, it's always been about consciousness. and got me teaching now. So, I um, started my own practice, uh, Mystic Yuga, which is a unique blend of Kemetic or Egyptian, Kabbalistic, and Dravidian or Chakra, uh, Kundalini Yoga. Um, and I teach that privately. Um, the website is mysticyuga.com. I don't know if we can plug it now, but I did it. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, it's M-Y-S-T-I-C-Y-U-G-A.com. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I'm in Atlanta right now, and I, it's personal. I don't, um, I haven't branched into uh, electronic format yet because I'm really trying to retain and um, highlight those traditional values of oral instruction face-to-face -face in person, you know. So, um, right now, you got to come to Atlanta to get those sessions. Um, I teach a couple public classes right now at Piedmont Park and Historic Fourth Ward Park. Um, but most of my instruction is coming to meet you where you are. So I come to your home. Um, I come to your your office gym. I come to your 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 park, you know, if you and your, your lady, uh, your partner wants to meet me at a park, then I come and meet you there. So I come to meet you where you are, and um, and we do yoga together. Yuga. 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 Okay. <laughs> Change the name. Uh, so that's where I am. That's where you are. Well, good. That's okay. a good place to be, man. Yeah. Thank okay. you for sharing. Thank so um, you that's definitely gave us a lot. Yeah, um, we're talking about your particular background. Um, and it out what you need to. <laughs> yeah, no, nah, it's all good. But one of the things um, that that uh, we as we meditate, you don't know, want to touch upon, is about the you know what inclusion, seeing how all things are related. You know, as far as like you know different spiritual traditions and spiritual myths are uh, different spiritual stories, but also just doing it from the place of expansion, meaning that. Um, from wherever we come from, you know, like I say, I come from a particular Christian focus, just like you do. I was raised Baptist like you. So my primary spiritual place of reference is the Bible. Uh, however, I had, we meditate. You know, we understand that the Bible is not some exclusive rites of passage to, you know, spirituality or salvation or, you know, the Bible and Christianity are not um, better than any other particular system. Mm -hmm. It's just one of, one of another, you know, one of another segment of the same. So, you know, we really try to um, enlighten people onto that uh, because essentially uh, as we both know the the under undercurrent themes that are within like the Bible or within the Tao or within you know uh, the metu things of that nature are all trying to get us to understand you know, the blueprint so to speak mm -hmm. of consciousness mm -hmm. of, um, you say the oneness with the Almighty you know how to be light bearers how to be agents of love light and change and things of that nature so just from that perspective um, Let's let's go back to the Bible for a moment. Okay. Let's go back. Let's, 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 let's go back to the Bible. Everybody got a Bible, right? Yeah, yeah. If, if not, you know, download the Bible app real quick. It really is a good book, like minus the indoctrination and the uh, exclusivity and that whole thing about hell and things of those nature. Uh, we can hopefully debunk a couple of those things, maybe in this conversation. Um, but nevertheless, dealing with the Bible, dealing with the Bible. Um, before we even get any type of esoteric thought, what has been the, the biggest thing the Bible has given you? You know, in your in your journey right now, stories. I think the most powerful thing about the Bible is the imagination. I think the most powerful thing about the Bible is the imagination of the authors. Mm -hmm. um, where did they get the ideas from? That's powerful. Mm -hmm. um, the wisdom. Wisdom is not something that you can purchase. It's not something that you can make up. It's not something that you can make up, but let's deal with that whole, like, Old Testament, like you say, specifically the Old Testament with the, the grand stories that they had. Now, let's see, we can get into some real crazy stuff. Like, if anyone has been exposed to Zachariah Stitching, for example, mm -hmm. you know, he may say that this was actual alien encounters from foreign beings landing, coming onto Earth. Mm -hmm. Nice and, story. And literally giving the Hebrew people all of the things that they wrote, you know, the whole encounters with Yahweh and fire coming from heaven was actually like an alien ship sending, you know, a laser down onto the ground, you know, or, um, like I say, some more of the uh, Dravidian uh, aspect where they say, 
you know, they went deep inside their consciousness and raised their consciousness level high enough to where they encountered what would be some type of foreign energy that was essentially dormant inside them because they hadn't activated that principle before, which gave them the messages. Or you could run into like a Seven Bomar from Astral Christ who believes everything is a is a archon, you know, or essentially an offspring of Yadabea, the false consciousness of reality exactly. that we, uh, <laughs> the false consciousness of reality where we think, you know, what we what we're seeing is actually the reality when we don't even understand how big, you know, the spirit is. Or essentially, we're living inside of an egg, so to speak, and the egg is like we're supposed to hatch out of it. So. Just of, of the few that I've kind of thrown at you, you know, what, what, how can you really manage to make any sense out of all of that when dealing with consciousness? Manage to make sense out of it. I think that in all of my seminary and theological experiences, um, and, and people searching for meaning, that's what we're meaning making machines. We want to. Um, understand these are natural inclinations, um, spheres of consciousness that we share with the divine blueprint, also known as um, sephira from the Kabbalistic tradition, or each sephira or sphere of consciousness within us, um, is going to give us ideas that and feelings and desires that we may not even be aware of. You know, why do we like to have friends? Who oh. likes to have friends? Why do we like to have love? Why do we like to learn information? Why do we like justice? Why do we like justice? Why, why do we like mercy? Why do we like joy, designing things, creativity, art, um, why do we like sex? <laughs> sex is good. And then why do we like stability, foundation, and I just went through a whole tree. Why do we like wisdom, power? Um, so these ten, and then the zero being complete peace and nirvana pure consciousness, with no, no thoughts, no things. Why do we like these things? Um, it's actually because they are programmed in our DNA. Mm -hmm. We are all in the likeness and image, holographic projections of one consciousness experiencing itself in its various characters within its own movie. So, um, as we begin to experience the external world, um, these urges, these tendencies, to use quantum physics, Heisenberg, these tendencies begin to um, express themselves in various ways, some more imbalanced than others. Mm -hmm. um, and that was to speak to the chakra thing, um, the chakra uh, mystery. Um, as Manly P. Hall states it. Um, well, let's pause right there. Because uh -oh. you, you said a whole lot. lot. Okay, you said a whole lot. So, you know, for somebody who's really trying to get into consciousness, you may have already lost them. So, let's bring it back. Let's bring it back. You say uh, we were made in the image and likeness. Now, traditionally speaking, from a Christian standpoint, you know, that is typically understood as, you know, the God of the Bible, you know, or Jesus, you know, or wherever Jesus came from, that whole type of thing. They usually attribute that same God of the New Testament to the one that's in the beginning that created human bodies. Um, let's break that down for a little bit. Um, well, for one, let's talk about the two creation stories that are even in the Bible. People may not even realize that there's one story and then there's a whole another one. Uh, the first one dealing with the creation of the universe and of the earth. And then the second story is actually the creation of human bodies. So, uh, again, you know, with the, there's various conscious versions of it, but what is the one that you can really makes it most succinct for the We Meditate community today. Well, I want to I wanna make things um, as simple as possible. So, when you are in the process of creation, you need a canvas first. You need an environment. That's why there's two creation stories. It's simple. It follows a lot, the, the, the natural laws. 
you have to have an environment in order to place something to live. Good, good, good. And so you have to make sure that this environment is sustainable, which is exactly what we're not doing right now to the planet. Yeah, we're not sustaining <laughs> the planet. Do not fall into the illusion that the planet is okay. Yeah. So <laughs> we are, uh, that's, a, that's a great example. So you have the home or the garden, the and garden. then you have the caretakers that then have then been created to maintain the garden. Now, have we been good gardeners? That's a good question. I don't want to go down that road just yet, but um, from the creation, cosmological story, uh, from the that the Christians have adopted. Uh, let's do it from the current right now, from Christian adaptation, and let's go back to the blueprint in which they got it from. So Christian yeah, adaptation, that's what I was The Garden say. of Eden is essentially a, a symbol for the earth in and of itself. Not just the, not only that, but the Garden of Eden, uh, Hadan, um, is also symbolic. There's always levels. There's, There's always to levels to this. Thing. Levels, <laughs> levels to this. <laughs> yes. um, and <laughs> what I love about Kabbalah, and this is this is all. These are all tools, okay? Like the, in the Buddhist tradition, when you speak to a mystic, uh, they use they may use a lot of words, very choice, but they say that these are fingers pointing at the moon. And that's, if there's one thing I could leave with this audience, anyone who's listening, that anytime you encounter something spiritually written that's uplifting, that's an explanation, there's levels to it and there are only fingers pointing at the moon. If you look at the finger, you'll miss the moon. Mm -hmm. These are only fingers pointing at the moon. So these stories that have been created by various intelligences throughout humanity's time on this planet are fingers pointing at the moon. So, going back to, to what we were talking about, uh, the levels of creation, um, you have uh, archetypical realm, you have ideas, and then you have patterns, and then you have the enforcers of the patterns or the coordinators, and then you have the actual physical manifestation. Mm -hmm. And that's mostly what people know because we're living in mostly uh, physical consciousness. Physical Consci realm, physical consciousness. Uh, physical, yeah, most of our primarily concern is what's going on here. And if we think hierarchical, that would be low. Mm -hmm. But it's all it's all one. It's all connected. Definitely. Yeah, definitely uh, as I say all connected when dealing with like the myth of creation, you know, and generally when you say to particularly religious people that these things are myths, you know, they usually get offended because generally myths... Because they haven't read Joseph Campbell. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah they don't know how powerful a myth is. Right, right. But by definition, sorry, people have an incorrect definition of what a myth is. Yeah. Uh, when you say that, oh, your whole religion is a myth, they get offended because they think myth means not real. When myth means it's a story or an explanation for something that has no explanation. Yeah. Like, like they say, you cannot fully understand God, but what is the Bible? It's an attempt to do so. And so, um, putting it in its proper place can help people kind of make the necessary detachments, I believe, so that they won't take these things so literal and, okay. uh, and won't be so uh, closed-minded in their action. But like I say, back to the Garden of Eden, because uh, I know with just a few of the symbols that I know, you know how things are, you say there's levels to all of this. In the Christian story, it talks about the Tigris and Euphrates rivers and things of that nature. If you look it up geographically, where those things are, there actually are real places on the earth. The... Uh, the rivers that they tied to, how they come from the uh, from the sea, was that the uh, Dead Sea, I believe? No, yeah, how tied to the Dead Sea. Where the rivers go and where the uh, the cradle of humanity is, where they say this is, it is an actual shape of a upside down triangle. Mm -hmm. and then the upside down triangle is a womb because the womb is actually the same size and symbol, or the same shape, shall I say, as a female's reproductive organs. The uh, what is it? What is it called? The uh, the, the, the ovaries. The, like the ovaries and the uh, the one part. Oh, man. What, what are we talking about? Oh, we talk. Well, sorry, ladies. I know. Sorry, ladies. Ladies. Now, yeah. we, we learned it. Well, I know. We're trying to figure out female anatomy. The whole yeah. thing and energy aspect. But nevertheless. Y'all know what it is. Right. If you look at actual female anatomy, all of the organs are literally in the shape of a upside down triangle. And what do women do? They birth from this exact same place. So, essentially, literally speaking, um, the myth meaning the spiritual aspects of what's going on in the cosmos are taking place on the earth realm as well. And that's where the cradle of humanity is, where the womb 
of Earth is at the Tigers and Euphrates rivers where they actually meet. So it's like, yeah, it is literal. I'm going to summarize everything you just said Go very ahead. simply in a hermetic axiom. Uh-oh. As above, so below. So below. You already yeah, knew that. Yeah. So anytime we see patterns reflected in, on the physical level of the Earth, and then we see the same pattern reflected in the luminal regions of consciousness and mystical symbols and things, um, it's for that very same reason that, 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 that this pattern is what it is, is a code to the matrix. It's this code and this code is going to follow certain patterns. Right. So these patterns then, we're looking on the earth for them, we're looking for how they manifest on the earth. The earth is a living being too, so it's also going to be a chakra, a Socratic system. There uh, are going to be levels of consciousness uh, that the earth has at various points. Um, actually, I'll just say this really quick, you know, where the sacred sites are and the various pyramids, the pyramid builders knew this consciousness mm -hmm. and uh, the, um, hopefully, you know, government will come knocking at my door, but militaries have also placed their bases. Placed many at military certain, installations at where many of the ley lines, the spiritual highways are, in other words, the veins of the earth actually cross. One of the biggest ones on the eastern seaboard is actually here in Atlanta at Stone Mountain Park, which is why it's this big lump of, of sedimentary rock. Um, for anyone living in the Atlanta region, literally climb up that, climb up that mountain and then take 20, 30 minutes meditating. You'll be a completely different person. Um, rocks grow. Yeah, rocks grow. Uh, mm -hmm. Rocks move because everything moves. The earth is moving. The earth is alive. And that's a part of the reasons why, you know, conscious folk are so like, take care of the earth. Like, it's not some just OB green thing. Like, it's literally alive. Like, imagine if, you know, there were tiny little things that you could see walking on you, and all they did was throw crap on your arm all day. Like, mm. they, all their ways, all they do is just throw it on you, as opposed to doing what's necessary. Eventually, or literally speaking, when something happens on your skin and an aberration like that takes place, what do you do? Or what happens? It itches, and then you scratch it. Mm. So imagine all of the inhabitants that place all of those things on your arm that you just scratched. You totally wrecked destruction upon that whole region. It's an apocalypse. It's an apocalypse. Nah, no, he's just scratching. You irritated so, him. Right. So the earth is being very, very agitated and irritated mm. in some regions, which is why we see the earth scratching and such crazy phenomena taking place. So let's stop giving the earth a reason to scratch itself. But anyway, let's get back to the story. Um, another part. Again, I, I like that whole human creation. So we got the first half of creation, talking about a myth and a literal interpretation of the womb of the earth, which are the variations of consciousness. Who made the humans then? So let's get back to that whole Babylonian uh, Genesis. That, you know that. Let's 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 break through for a minute here. Let's really let's really punch that. So that's the question: Who made the humans? Who made living beings? Mm -hmm. So you have you have. Um, you have the creation of the environment, the spirit of God over the face of the deep. You have water. You have various planetary bodies being placed um, before. So you have a procession. You know, there is a succession of things that come in, the, in an order. And then finally you get, well, you get, you get plants and animals. Let's not forget that they were here first. Place animals were here first and they're just as li alive as human beings are. They just don't talk. And we treat them. <laughs> we treat them with such neglects. Yeah. They're um, all sentient beings, which is, if you've ever gone through a fraternal process, anybody, they do weird stuff to you, like, don't walk on grass. And you're like, why don't I walk on grass? Because you're trying to go through a transformation process, and in your transformation process to get the most out of your regeneration, you need to be as purified as possible. In order to be as purified as possible, you need to retain and uphold as much life as you possibly can. So you don't want to squish or squash or disconnect from life. So when you literally walk on grass, you're smushing, in essence, people. <laughs> so like, you stop smushing people uh, when you're going through a fraternal process, but it should extend further off into your regular being where you just simply have respect for everything that you see, whether it is actually alive in a high frequency or, not say dead, but in a dense frequency like this wall here. This wall essentially is, is alive. It's just in a dense frequency that causes it to not move in front of our eyes. Mm -hmm. So again, sorry, I love you. Mm -hmm. That is great. It's great. Good stuff. Good stuff. And, and when you wake up your third eye, you will see that this wall is vibrating and pulsating and mm -hmm. 
Get, We're not crazy. Yeah. <laughs> it's almost like the one scene if you've ever seen The Matrix when The uh, Matrix goes to see the Oracle Damn. for the first time and the little Buddhist monk, white kid, bald head, little kid is there and he tells Neo there is no spoon. And Neo didn't get it um, until maybe like what? Until the end of the movie. Until he saw the, the, the code. And yeah, saw and the, code. Was in the code. And it's no real spoon. And the spoon, like he said, what is it? It's not the spoon that bends, it's, it's you. you. And so, uh, essentially, because all of itself, meaning that we're all made of the same subatomic particles, um, scientifically proven, look it up, I've said it in darn near every video I've made this far, but uh, all of the same subatomic particles make up everything, and we're all just flowing in and out of, or bouncing back and forth off of each other. Mm -hmm. And uh, as long as we become more malleable, meaning more flexible, more willing to uh, be uh, agents of change, more be willing Yoga. to go with the flow, yes, go with the flow of what life is giving us, we could uh, be more alive and be more connected. So, but, but still, it's hard to do so because we're stuck in human bodies. So, who made these human vessels? I'm not stuck. Um, the, there's a creator consciousness, mm -hmm. a designer consciousness, a consciousness that knows and I, I want to make this, I like to make it very simple. When you sit down to draw on a paper and you design a head and you design a neck and you design shoulders and you design arms and you design the torso and you design the pelvis, the reproductive organ, you, you design the legs and you design the feet. Every single thing that you design is going to have purpose. Meaning. And its structure is going to be unified. This is the law of Ma'at. Every single thing uh, that goes into the design, the blueprint for that pattern that you're expressing, um, there's a reason for it. And that reason is connected to everything. Nothing is isolated. Nothing is supposedly individual. It's it's individual and it's, well, that's, actually, I love this word. It is an individual. It is an indivisible duality. Mm -hmm. So it is made up of, of complementary opposites. We look at opposites as opposing most of the time, but it is made up of a one that is complementary. And that's when you get your yin and yang thing. So mm -hmm. um, this consciousness, uh, they call it the carpenter. Uh, Alsair, Kether, um, the one, the supreme being emerged from a state of inactivity, emerged from a state of complete blackness and darkness and becomes self-aware and says, I am. <laughs> so essentially this I am comes out of nothing, materializes into no something. No thing. Yeah, the no thing materializes into something, and then realizes Conscious. itself. Consciousness. And then it's, the, 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 so then it becomes aware. It's like, it's like a baby. That's why I love the Matrix. Mm -hmm. There's a big baby that Ooh. Leo encounters at the end. This big baby says, oh, I am, and I'm aware of all the limitless possibilities that exist within zero. So if you look at, I love the Tree of Life, for example, because the, the, the structure of it shows how this crown is looking back into zero. It's looking back into the limitless, no thingness, and that's how it gains its unity consciousness, its wisdom consciousness, and ultimately its power consciousness. Mm -hmm. It's to look back up into the unmanifest. Mm -hmm. So one is where we're at, the baby consciousness says, I want to create. I, and there's so many things that I can create from, so then I choose with wisdom what to create. Um, and then it's like, okay, dang. There's another part to it, the power. Okay, so, and this is interesting because this is like the man and the woman. And that's why the crown is the father, the son, or the father, the child, and the mother. The first family, Osiris, Isis, and Horus. Uh, the one consciousness has to bring forth its creative faculties. The creative faculty is going to be psychologically the self-conscious mind, mm -hmm. the will to choose, mm -hmm. and then the ability, the subconscious mind, the power to do. 
So now armed with the consciousness to create, the limitless substance and energy of what it's going to create with, the wisdom and the will to create, and then the power or ability to create, now your crown is complete. Everything that's below the top crown, uh, the trinity, the triangle of creation that points back into zero, everything that falls below it is going to be uh, what manifests into different levels of reality. You have something to say. Go ahead. Oh, I mean, all I had to say was just how all of these. And hopefully, that answered the question. That's what creates, and I don't want to. I don't want to anthropomorphize it because that's where we get into trouble. Right. <laughs> the background anthropomorphization is when you make consciousness or essentially waves of energy, flows of energy, into a human. I.e., God is a man. He God, or even as our old ancestors did, she gods, where they uh, said simply feminine aspects of energy, meaning energy moves. Energy waves that are more of a nurturing aspect, or like you say, the powerful energetic aspects that fuel your creation, or your creative energy. Uh, that's a feminine aspect, or feminine energy. But you can anthropomorphize it, make it into a human, and then now you have a female god. Um, but what I wanted to say was, uh, like you say, bring it home and make it simple. Like, yes, you're talking about it from an ethereal realm, but isn't that exactly what happens when a baby is born? This baby comes out of the semen. That is essentially in a spheric form. Um, I, you know, I don't want to get too graphic, but you know, people who've encountered sex know what that is. Um, this essentially this spheric fluid or juice. Mm. It, it goes up the stream of consciousness and then meets the female. Got to swim, don't it? Got to swim. And everybody don't make it. Everybody definitely everybody doesn't make it. And once he the sperm is what millions of. There's like a hundred million of those bad boys in there, but only one makes it through. Uh, essentially, you have to swim up, swim up in consciousness, like you say, up in consciousness. To then go to the womb of creation, which is a dark place. It's it's in complete darkness. I mean, just literally speaking. Of course, you may not have any memories of you being in the womb. They don't but, have no eyes. Right. But, okay. Yeah. We can't <laughs> maybe see anything inside a pregnant stomach. No, it's completely enwrapped in that womb, which is dark. Darkness. A dark, dark wet within darkness. Darkness within darkness. A dark, wet, dank, uh, smelly. If you ever been out of birth before, oh my gosh, it smells terrible. Um. A dark, dank place that eventually, once the process of whatever this creative, this creative energy puts a whole baby together, and then it comes out, and this baby has to go through the process on the earth, where it goes from a place of no understanding, no faculties, no anything, to eventually coming to its own realization of I am, meaning that I am somebody, or I am something, I have a purpose, and then going through the process of realizing that. And then, like you say, however big they want to realize it, being based on the uh, the limitations that they put out there into the universe. Mm -hmm. So we're simply just replicating the story of creation or the creative process over and over and over mm -hmm. again. So yes, it is literal. That's what we meditate want to have you see. Like yes, these stories are literal, but they're literal not because of one particular family owns the story and everybody else needs to get along with their story type of thing. It's literal because it's scientific. It's literal because it's the connection of spirituality on the earth. Um, it's, it's literal because it's us. It's the way. It's, it's the Tao. It's what it means. It's the way. <laughs> it's the way things work. It's mm -hmm. the way. It's the way creation uh, creates. That's good. <laughs> That's good. So, so good. Okay. okay. So we got first story. We got second story. We've got how does that actually imply what you know particular life purpose may be. But um, let's get into just a hint of history. A hint of history. Um, uh, whose story? Exactly. Where did these stories go from? Like, his, his story or her story? <laughs> Our story. Our story. I like Our story. story. Listen, <laughs> rename all the classes now. Our story. Our story. Not history. Our story. Our story. Mm -hmm. Just a political thing here. In the modern context, many things are referenced as he because we live in a patriarchal society, meaning a male dominant society. So, literally, the word his story was inspired by the fact that they believed that men were the only like people able to write stories down correctly, so they put a his or an e in front of it. Oh, it gets deep, but uh, we'll get there maybe on another day. It's because they only educated men. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Only men were educated in, in the, uh, what is that, from pretty much the uh, from the Hebrew society on forward, unfortunately. That's one of the faults 
of uh, the Hebrew society, like Old Testament, New Testament world. Um, and that's something that, you know, especially Christians, you know, I still identify with it a little bit. Uh, you know, us Christians really need to take a sober, sober look at it because um, from a conscious level, um, knowing that those two energies, masculine and feminine, are still resonating with inside of our body, knowing that the, the, the makeup and design of the body, those make up the two hemispheres of the body. So when you only advocate or only express the he side, you literally are only building up or strengthening up one side of your consciousness and you're completely ignoring like the whole other side of your body. Um, and brain. And brain. Actually, really, it is your brain. Um, um, and so it is important to try to engage the feminine aspect of your own consciousness, your own psyche, uh, because it actually helps your imagination. It helps you in your creative abilities. It helps you in your inspiration. Um, again, I'm not talking about every church, but just from my own personal experience, maybe you can back me up here, most church experience only tells you to like be complicit with a society. Meaning, you know, do what you need to do, be, be a moral person so that you can get an education and you can get a job. Like, those are not bad things, but those things only advocate, like, the ground level of, like, purpose. You know, they don't um, raise up the feminine aspect of what are your dreams and your aspirations and your creative wonders that you can change the world. That is the feminine energy that uh, should be more advocated and expressed uh, in a typical, uh, very traditional church setting. But shout out to all of the other uh, inspiration centers, I like to call them, that still, uh, that, you know, have a Christian paradigm of thought, but really raise up that feminine energy, even if they may not uh, say it's a feminine aspect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So back to, the, like, who let's, who made up these stories, man? So we got, you know, I said, we got the Christian story, but who did they take it from? Us. We. There's only one consciousness. Mm -hmm. And so when you say who made up these stories, it's that consciousness, um, exists everywhere. It's it's really who has the access the access to it, who has learned how to steal their mind in such a way where they can step back from their mind and then perceive the truth without all the colorings that most of the human population uses use right now <laughs> our lenses, you know. So there have been only certain um, men and women throughout history that we have all prophets or sages or mystics or seers, seers, um, and these people have um, had the opportunity to perceive, uh, to look through the veil, to look behind the veil, uh, and to um, perceiving reality as it truly is, and perceiving the creative process, and to bringing us and as much as they can communicate something that is completely uh, mm -hmm. beyond words, the Tao opens up by saying, the Tao that can be told is not the eternal Tao. The name that can be named is not the eternal name. So, say that again. <laughs> the name that can be named is not the eternal name. The so, Tao opens up by saying, this was written uh, by Lao Tzu, or is credited to him, this would be one of those ancient sage mystics from the Chinese tradition, or at least that's what historically we've um, uh, relegated his wisdom to. The Tao Te Ching opens up and says, the Tao, the Tao means the way. The way is just a word that he, he, he didn't know how, how, how else to explain it. And that's why poetry, most of the time we see these stories, these myths, they are written in a very poetic, rendering because when you perceive and you know this through astral projection and when you perceive uh, the reality behind the relativity um, you everything flows into it it's hard to, to talk about it's hard it's to hard to express that that's, that's, <laughs> let's talk about it look that's the beauty of song and the beauty of poetry um, just a quick bible lesson um the Bible is written in either prose or poetry or story, mm. um, and generally like some type of mashup of both. Which is why um, reading it has such like eloquence, you know. Like like say, um, I don't necessarily advocate the King James Bible, but that's why it's so. And thou said the Lord, and it look like it has a essential a flow to it that has a gravitational pull. That gravitational pull is not because of the book itself, 
but it's because of the way that it is written. Um, like a basic term. If you ever see somebody just walking down the street talking to themselves, you might think like, yeah, that person might be a little crazy. Mm -hmm. But if they're walk same person walking down the street whistling a tune or singing a song that is the same lyrics of like whatever conversation you may be thinking they're having with themselves, you're like, oh, they're singing a song. Like that's the type of response that these things have because of the waves and uh, flows of energy. Poet, poetry and music and song, they have like that gracefulness, you know, that like, nice grace to it that makes things stick. Um, that's why like ABCs, for instance, are doing a song. A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Like you'll never forget that. But try to like memorize, have a, you know, an elementary school kid try to memorize the alphabet just by strict, like just saying of the letters. I guarantee it's going to take them twice as long to figure it out or commit it to memory. Um, if you've ever encountered a teenager, for instance, like tell them to sing Michael, uh, Michael Jackson song. Like I bet you they know that Michael Jackson song. That was from an era before they were even born. But ask them like some type of uh, quantum math problem that they're currently trying to figure out. They had the hardest time ever trying to like it. I'll give you an even more powerful example. As a chaplain working with mm -hmm. Alzheimer's patients, okay, they remember songs. They never forget songs. Tell me, give me your credentials again, you were what? I uh, <laughs> <laughs> forgot about that part. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I just finished my residency at Emory Hospital um, last fall, actually, August, um, as a chaplain. So I help people die. <laughs> he openly practices his spirituality as a living. So neither he or I are just random people on the internet like, hey, we know some stuff. No, we actually live it. But, uh, yeah, like you say, Alzheimer's citizen. Oh, yeah, patients, yeah, patients. Patients, yeah. So that, this, this just speaks, once again, I was giving another example of the power of prose, the power of iambic pentameter, the, the power of putting together words and phrases in a way that the consciousness, this is what the ancients knew, um, the consciousness is able to retain that information better, is able to integrate it into the spirit. Say, don't let that song get into your spirit. And let those words get into your spirit. Um, I was about to rap, but I couldn't remember anything to rap. <laughs> <laughs> so um, when you uh, when you look at these, and that's that's the other things. The Tao says do away with. Uh, yeah, I've noticed. I love the Tao. The Tao says do away with wisdom. It says do away with holiness. And people are like, oh, hold on now. Wait a minute. Holiness is hold right. On. Oh, hold on, hold on. Holiness is right. And what it means is <laughs> let go of, you must you must unlearn what you have learned. Yoda's words encompass this. So that when you come to books like the Bible, when you come to books like the Bhagavad Gita, when you come to the Quran, when you come to Lao Tzu's writings, when you come to Rumi's poetry, well, it's easier with poetry. You don't, you don't see people going around expressing some type of authority or knowledge about poetry because everybody's going to get something different from it. And that's okay. But something happened to where, with particular religious books, we forgot about that. And now we are just like, no, that's right or that's wrong. And that's, that's, not, a, that's not a good way to see it. It's very limiting. Because the beauty of the poetry and the beauty of the music is whatever consciousness you bring to it is going to be what you get from it. It reflects back. It reflects back to you what you see in it. That's, that's the, the power, so to speak, of these mystic books. Like, uh, like I say, Christians always like to say, you know, the Bible is the living word of the, God. No, this is what the, the Bible says. <laughs> no, no, no. no. There's the one Bible thing I learned in reference. seminary. The Bible don't say nothing. We say that. You say it. <laughs> it's so funny. It's, it takes a long time for people to like wrap their mind around it, but essentially it's trying to say that the reason well, why the Bible is living is because we're alive. And then we use our living consciousness to read the words on the page, and then we interpret it, and our brain sends signals through our bodies that are alive, and then helps us to speak whatever it is saying or do whatever we think it is saying. So it's alive. Um, like you say, it's a, it's an old axiom or old thing they used to say. You know, reading one scripture, you know, today, come back to it six months later, it's going to have a completely different meaning to you. Because you're different. Exactly. Not because the Bible changed. I changed. But, uh, yeah, that's essentially what this whole 
I think that, that really kind of sums up this whole thing. That's really what we're all doing. We're just trying to get our experience to see what, what we say. But then after we get what we say, I want to learn what you say. Yeah. Yeah. And then we all come together yeah. and then we grow and expand. That's experience. The doubt that can be told, the, 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 and I'll ex- the, the doubt, because I'm getting writing a dissertation on it right now. Yeah, I'm doing that too. That's why I don't like talking about myself. Yeah. That's why I like talking about myself, because I'm doing too much. Because uh, I'm writing a dissertation on the Tao. Okay, mm-hmm. what is the Tao? And what I've come to understand about the Tao in my preliminary uh, exploration into it right now is that the Tao is the way it works. The way it, capital I-T, works. Another way I've rendered it is the process uh, whereby Consciousness creates. Mm-hmm. So, when the opening statement says the Tao that can be told is not the eternal Tao, it means that whatever type of book, scripture, see that word even has a tint on it, a connotation that something is not scripture. You know? <laughs> be careful. Uh, anything that is expressive of a higher consciousness of power, energy, or intelligence, um, and how it does anything. Uh, it's and, and, and you try to speak that or teach someone mm-hmm. or write it down, you're going to fall short of its true reality inherently because anything that you bring from the abstract realm into the manifested realm is going to lose 10%. <laughs> keep, keep that in mind. It's going to lose some of its value Inherently, because the physical realm is at a lower vibration. The higher you go in, in consciousness and in creation, things exist on higher planes and frequencies of, of being. So, yeah, that's good. I think we, yeah, we answered the question. Yeah, we did. Some kind of way. I know. Some kind of way, all <laughs> questions really are answered. <laughs> yeah. Some and that's simply because. Um, we just share all of the ideas of consciousness, whether they be in mythological form, literal interpretation, scientific influence, or just straight from the mystery itself, meaning the land of no words. We're going to talk about it until it all makes sense. So hopefully we've made some sense for you today. Um, once again, thank you, my brother. Okay. All right, good. Mr. Good. John. It's part of handshake you got there. Hey, thank you. That's right. <laughs> um, and thank you. We Meditate Community. I'm here for you. This is... We meditate.